good tonight in Adelaide for a lovely, warm, engaged networking session. Um, and people beginning to relax um, in this great event. And I, I very much thank the organisers and uh, all of the time that's required to bring it together. So um, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, Korea uh, and on the journey, some of the ways in which uh, we can see the importance of a diversity of inputs across all parts of that STEM value chain. So I thought I'd tell a story in about four plus one chapters, um, which sort of navigates and meanders through a career. Um, and of course, one always is terribly insightful about your career, particularly after all the events have happened. And, and you immediately develop this incredibly um, astute view, um, just not at the time you were going through the uh, issues you were going through. But I'll reflect on that as we go through. And I think that your, your beginning of your journey has a lot to do with your destination. Family, where you were brought up. Uh, what was the conversation around the dinner table? What were those hopes and dreams for um, the sons and daughters in the family? In my case, three daughters. And I often think there was something in that. We grew up in Northern Ireland, in Belfast, overlooking Belfast Harbour. And uh, it was a wonderful place. And my Northern Irish family was classic Northern Irish. The way we had entertainment, uh, no social media, um, was social media. But this was in the living room of my grandmother's house in uh, a place uh, which is a lovely street. And uh, when the kids got tired, they could just go and swing around the rope around the lamp post. That was <laughs> very safe. And reasonably, all the family packed into the living room and just yelled at each other in great stories. And the volume had to go up because if you had to get in on the motorway of the conversation, you had to be louder and smarter than the person that you were picking the story thread up from. So they'd go, oh, no, 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 they never said that. No, what they said was, oh, no, you're, you're not. And then, of course, all the side conversations gone. So you talk quick, you argue, and unless you have a real point, your family will wipe you off the motorway of the conversation, and you can just give up now. So, uh, good training, actually, in turn, good training. Uh, Northern Ireland was a bit difficult at the time, sectarian violence. We moved to a steel-making city in the north of England, <coughs> and Scunthorpe. Many of you may not know it, some of you may. Um, it was called on the number plates in the cars, Garden City of the North. Actually, slight overstatement. <laughs> you can see that. But I went to a school that was a making of me, most unlikely place. Um, an unlikely school, very large, comprehensive. Um, and it was the making of me because in Northern Ireland, in Belfast, I'd gone to this girls' school and they were really keen about how you wore your scarf and you bury your gloves. I never knew where any of those were. I had to walk around with my kind of pretending I had my gloves on, uh, just put my hands in pockets so people can see I've lost them completely. Um, and the choices you could do Latin or domestic science, big choice, uh, great. Um, I did choose Latin. Um, I think I actually should have stuck to the other. Um, then came across to a school with values, um, education. And I realised I just not enough, and uh, I had very clear thoughts I was going to pay attention instead of not paying attention. And I'm not sure why it was at that point, but it's just a new maturity or just a sense that this was a different place that uh, our family was now in. And it was there that a teacher, a coaching teacher, said, uh, look, uh, and this is a very large school, it's very northern, very different uh, groups of people. Um, now, if we pick about 10 out of the six form, and the six, I think, I don't know, a couple of hundred, uh, to sort of put their names forward, to do the Oxford entrance exam. And so we thought you might want to do that. Now, I didn't really understand what that meant. I didn't know what Oxford was. Out of radio and no, not to think or anything. Mm -hmm. um, it was a completely different world, and nobody knew what the opportunity to do that was. They just turned off to their old coaches. And they were unintelligible. They weren't actually saying, you know, give them Formula 4 or um, Voltage Calculation. They were things like Voltage, Play, and this is in French, mind you. It was necessary to cultivate what they got on your garden. Good stuff. You know, it's very helpful. It's great. And so, completely different world, and 
right? Because there were two crises, as in October for time, for men who had been born as in for women. So, you know, it was much more business to see how you would learn how to do this biology in Europe and to get the news to. Guys are very happy. Yep, you have no idea about that. I thought I was pretty smart, but I keep taking that. Yep, it's pretty good. Notice that I'm also using Oxford teachers very hardly more than I speak. And notice that everyone was being extremely polite to me and said, Never in my life will I bring another class of story again. So, in the dream, I was asked uh, a question if I did not know the answer, and what did I think of this? And I took my medical knowledge to focus, and I just punctured it all on black at that moment, and it all sank in, and I just said, I don't agree with that statement. Now, this is the moment where the next question is, why don't you agree with that statement? And you don't actually know what the statement meant. Um, but actually, in terms of the girl on her right, I said, well, that's an interesting position she holds. Why do you think she holds it? I'm thinking the girl actually um, was warm towards me, shall I say? <laughs> and by all of those small, different things that she carried through, confidence, Pretty sure she seems good, and why not give this a go? You will come through into this absolutely different world. And for me, I had no idea I was speaking in this environment until I was in it. I just did not know how much I enjoyed finding out about things that were not known. And the opportunity to sit in front of a, somebody who would spend an hour with you, um, actually discussing in real terms why you thought what you thought. Uh, what set of arguments did you put? This is the way this part of science is going. It was for me just uh, absolutely a change in my life, sliding door time. My Northern Irish family, and I've talked about them before, basically said, Well, I, I went on to do a PhD in Oxford in my big bill, and because I really enjoyed it. And actually, my PhD my, uh, supervisor was Australian, so I went up to John Radcliffe Hospital, which is a terrible ride on a bike up a hill. And uh, was to read this essay, first time I'd met him. And at the end of that, he said, oh, that's good, let's talk about this. Opened a fridge and pulled out a beer, a cold beer, a fat oh, new <laughs> beer could be cold. And um, it wasn't sherry. And I'd been drinking my way through every tutorial with a glass, the traditional glass of sherry at the end. And I thought, this is really interesting. And it was a very natural conversation. Again, thinking through the elements of, uh, well, why don't you come and do a PhD with you? My Northern Irish family wasn't sure that I was a proper doctor, because that's not a proper doctor. <laughs> you know, uh, I do say my husband met my Northern Irish aunt, and they sat there on the sofa with the handbags on the knee, and all of a sudden he realised it wasn't a social occasion, which was a job for me to <laughs> And he, I could see him sitting up, trying to appear very kind of, like, I can handle the situation. The fact they talk 50 times quicker than he, he possibly talk and he had no understanding of what they were saying did not help the job in terms of However, um, whether it was that, and I suspect it was, and in stories, you know, families are very powerful influences in our lives, and, they, and that is natural. But in a sense, we are exploring and making them proud. So I did, I did my clinical training in Cambridge, um, and I worked through, and I very much enjoyed that. <coughs> And then one night, my Australian supervisor called and said, Caroline, I'm in, back in Australia at Monash. Come out for a year, just a year. And I said, I'd actually been awake for 18 hours on, on duty and lost the will to live, really, and <laughs> said, yes, I will do that, quite definitely, because I wanted to remember I'd said that in the morning. And I did. I came. I came to Australia. I knew nothing about Australia except that what was drawing me was the opportunity to do work in the field of development, which I really was passionate about. Why is it that we think of the passive fetus, the baby before it's born, when it's terribly active, adjusting, adapting, making sure it survives, tuning its physiology, making certain that whatever signals it gets in the womb, it's going to navigate through to be born at all costs. And what happens when that went wrong? when the baby was born too small, what happens when signals about its nutritional environment 
uh, were such that it turned out that when it was born, it was a different nutritional environment. And why did that increase the risk of metabolic disease? And I loved it. I loved running a lab. I very much uh, enjoyed that experience. And so, in a sense, my education made sense, but it was only after I had found how I was going to integrate it. And I think that's what people do. There's no bad about a good education, no matter what subjects or disciplines one chooses. It's actually simply finding out what it is you don't want to do is as important as what you actually do. Um, when I was in Oxford at the time, I was pretty sure that any issue to do with women in STEM that might have existed, and I hadn't paid it much attention, was pretty done, done and dusted. Well, we've been there, we've done that, we were quite clearly, you know, we're talking 70s and 80s here, that was in the past. Good to have that confidence. This was a Nobel laureate in chemistry, Dorothy Hodgkin, and um, I didn't know, actually, it had a female Nobel laureate in chemistry. Um, but, and I didn't know about the notorious headlines when she won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> Good old Daily Mail. Oh, no. um, I also, you know, uh, prize the mother of three. Excellent. Good. Fantastic. Um, I like the story actually when she was sitting next at a high table at her Oxford College and a visitor who was sitting next to her said, Oh, and what do you do? And she said, Oh, I don't like this. Red flag. And she said, Oh, good, good. Well then, yes. How do you find being a woman in science? And she said, a lot better since I won the Nobel Prize. I know, right. So reasonably, all of that was in the past, and this was a quote from Mary Lou Hadou, who was the head of the uh, biological sciences in the MIT faculty at the 1990s. This is another dimension of history on, so we're at now another couple of decades. And each generation of young women goes forward with confidence because they know the past is pretty much irrelevant to their future. And I think in this talk, uh, for me, it is that sense of um, reflecting back about how and in what way uh, we take stock to find that some of the past has indeed impeded the future of bright people, that we have to change um, the future. Um, I didn't know at the time that I went into and I came across to uh, lead a um, came to Adelaide in the 1990s to lead a department of physiology at the University of Adelaide, and I didn't know at that time at all that men and women's rating CVs gave lower ratings when they actually believe the work is a woman's. So that was done as a very serious study. Student ratings are tougher. MIT there was a big study that got ended up published in Nature. The professors, the female professors in MIT, considered that they weren't getting as much funding from the university, that there was a whole set of issues that seemed to go against them in particular situations. And they did, to give it as due, did a study for MIT and did find in the report that marginalisation increased as women got more senior, um, accompanied by difference in sal salaries, uh, the pay gaps, space, awards, and particularly where people were just I really had a vested interest and it was people like me was the dictating the allocation of resources mm -hmm. as distinct uh, to merit. And these were things that, again, uh, we were conscious of. And I thought this was a very reflective piece. This was the actual, they did the study, they did a report, and they basically actually articulated that this was a series of uh, small, uh, incremental disadvantages that accrued over a career, that was enough over time to provide a significant material disadvantage. And that during your early years, most people consider, look, reasonably, um, gender's nothing to do with it, we're moving forwards. But as you moved forwards, that accumulation had an impact, whereas male colleagues uh, simply went forward um, And I think, you know, our first instinct is to die, to deny a problem exists, uh, to blame it on the pipeline or circumstances and choices. None of those explanations address these. And by and large, most studies have found that all of the elements of explanation for those accrual of disadvantages don't actually explain it at all. So then I moved into what I would call uh, both juggling a research career, uh, juggling the lab, 
uh, taking the leadership role and was now coming through as a leader. And in leadership, there's a lot to learn. I was uh, young uh, at the time. I think I was about in my early 30s when I took over the department. It was not the best house in a good street, but we worked really hard and it was a phenomenal group of people and we came through. And so then more senior roles called and I became a deputy vice chancellor eventually at the University of South Australia, still researching, still traveling, still um, earning grants, still doing the pieces of work. And I think what I want to, to say here is that for those of you as, in, aspiring as, as uh, female leaders and we need female leaders, the first you had to get your credibility, which is to be a leading researcher. And uh, many people think that's the, that is actually the pathway to then taking on leadership roles, but it isn't. You need to be the leading researcher, and then you need to learn how to be a research leader. There's a gap. It's necessary, but not sufficient to be a leading researcher. And it's finding that skill set which comes around strategy, foresight, and to take a group of people and derive the best possible outcome from the conversations that will move forward to meet the future coming to us. At this time, people did a lot, and spoke a lot, of course, about the glass ceiling, but this, to me, now we're in 2007, made much more sense. And it was really that for female leaders, and it was the first article I'd seen, it was in the Harvard Business Review, and I commend it to those of you who have not seen it, that it was a labyrinth of leadership for women. Because passing through a labyrinth isn't simple to to make progress, then you go back, then you try another route, then you turn the wrong way, then you have to go and trace your steps back. But if you know that the centre and you can get to it, those goals appear to be And so what it was is that as you're going through, it's not that you hit suddenly a ceiling. It's that all the way through you are accruing minor obstacles, minor disadvantages, second-guessing yourself not sure quite why it is that there is a different dialogue in a room uh, with male and female leaders. Uh, there are many things. Now, for Northern Irish people who argue, this is a pretty tough list, I can tell you. Uh, my aunts wouldn't have any uh, suck of this. Um, staring at each other or speaking to them, pointing at them, is much more damaging for women than for men. This is uh, very much a large study. If you're assertive, my goodness me, you can reduce a woman's chances of getting a job or advancing in her career. And I remember being in a queue in a cafe at this, about this time that I was looking at this, and I said, oh, no, the group goes through. And this woman said, no, you must be more assertive. And I'm thinking, no, no, I don't. <laughs> um, so you get many confusing signals to just express who you are and your leadership. And simply disagreeing can get women into trouble. And men who disagree or are dominant, not a problem, because we have associated these traits, because men have been leaders for more than years than women have, that these are uh, not female traits. And then we confuse ourselves because we worry a lot about how our managers are comfortable with our style. And this all read true. It didn't have a list of ways necessarily to deal with it, but understanding that this was a shared experience is really helpful. Because then you can begin to discuss as a leader, and then I moved into the University of Newcastle as the Vice Chancellor, and you can begin to bring some of these to your executive table, and then you're moving through into the unconscious bias that people bring unwittingly, men and women, to people who are different and not like themselves. And that is incredibly useful because it explains this piece of work that um, across those last two decades. So for a large part of that time, I have spent a great deal of time, I firmly believe, supporting women, adapt to a system which is relatively difficult or was difficult. This is back to 1999, 2003. This is just seniority and positions across the OECD in science careers. And as you get more senior, you get fewer women and more men. That's the past, but it's not because that's 2011 and that's natural and physical sciences that's the blue is the women it's senior academic roles we're down to 12 or something percent and the men and that's something which is startled people startled people because we have not made progress 
And the pipeline is a myth. There's plenty of women to fill it. There are more than enough women to fill this pipeline. And that's become quite clear on uh, many continents. This was my lowest moment, actually, in the last couple of weeks. At Leiden, have an analysis of the proportion of, of authorships on published research papers that are male and female. Some of them don't know, so we'll put them to one side. This is the proportion of female authorships on all mathematics papers as a proportion of female plus male authorships. And I like that I did this on a Sunday because I wanted to show it in a, in a presentation I was doing. I didn't know what the answer would be. Came out of their database. And this is Australian universities. And you've got the highest uh, at the top, and then it falls away. And the mean in Australia of papers, that not with, of papers, of authorships, female authorships on research <coughs> publications in mathematics, the mean is 12.5%, going from about 17 to 4.5%. Somebody said, oh, I'm glad we're in the good group. And I kind of, I get startled, as I still get startled, when two digits in some things that women do is a good result, you know? It doesn't matter what two digits they are, 12 and a half, we'll take 12 and a half. Uh, so not so good. And this tells me that the momentum at the moment being established, the change that is going through, isn't about helping women adapt to the system at all. Um, it's helping the system adapt. Women. And getting this right is really important. We are moving across jurisdictions in the world to move out of the traditional manufacturing, as you know, the mineral, the, the coal mining, resources based uh, commodity sectors, really coming across into Australia to drive a new knowledge based economy, uh, uh, economy which is almost solely about emerging technologies, it's about new knowledge, it's about creativity and ideas in science and knowledge exchange to really address some of the issues to do with our environment and our health and uh, building completely different industries like space. And going into regions, and I was in the University of Newcastle, was in the Hunter region, this was incredibly important and we worked hard as a partnership to really change that context. There's a lot spoken about Industry 4.0. The first three industrial revolutions about massification of production through power, whether it's steam or water, electricity, and then autonomous systems with reasonably uh, digital uh, transformation. But more recently, the power of machine learning, of artificial intelligence, of driving some remarkable connected physical systems with cyber intelligence, and then layering on biological systems gives us so much more power and complexity in ways to address health problems, in ways to create new modes of communication, new ways of uh, dealing with transport with almost every part of our existence, aged care. Um, so all of this is going on right as we speak. And at this point in time, we have to begin to converge disciplines, the technology, the engineering, and the health science, and medicine. And we have to really crunch them together to get all of the best that we can to address some of the most complex medical and health problems. This was a Future of Health report from MIT a couple of years ago that said, actually, we need technology and health to begin to share disciplinary space, not interdisciplinary, converge them. And important in this is the presence of diversity. And it's not just gender. But if you are in a room where people think differently, that is the room to be in, in science. Because science is about thinking differently all the time. Why something is not so? What is it we don't know? How can we? create something better than what we have. It's a fabulous career because you're always questioning and you want to be in a place where people question differently from you. This was the head of Credit Suisse. We did a large study how having women on boards added remarkable value to uh, the return on equity. And it wasn't a greater ability of one gender. It's just that a more diverse group makes for diff much better 
um, decision making and corporate performance. And a very clear statement, if you're not promoting diversity, you're not acting in the best interests of your companies and you should be held accountable. This has emerged really clearly across major studies. This was the study of 26,000 company directors that came to this conclusion. So this is the plus one. The system has to adapt to women. And I think we've tried, I'm a scientist, we've done a lot of experiments and they haven't worked. By and large, 12.5% of all the ships on maths papers are of women. I think we should do a different set of experiments. Yeah, you know, because if you keep doing the experiment and you fail, and you're doing the same one, you're not going to get that next grant. Uh, so you're going to have to redefine what we mean by the scientific researcher. We've done some good work in Australia in the SAGE initiative and the Women in STEM Decade or Plan. We've done really good work for three decades in this space. We've got to now get the system to accommodate the recommendations and reasonably move forwards. And my particular piece is when I went into medicine and if I was to train as a surgeon, let's say I went off and had my family, we had three kids under five, I don't know what we were doing, I was a reproductive physiologist, what was I thinking? <laughs> um, anyway, um, nothing much for 10 years after that. <laughs> um, so reasonably, um, if, if you were in medicine and you went off and had your family and you came back, you might do you know, six months through training, but you come back as a surgeon. You wouldn't come back as an intern paid less than the going rate because that's all the hospital had to pay you with. And yet, across science, there are many people, and a majority turn out to be women, who come back and are very grateful, having had a doctorate and experience and, and have done a lot of leadership they're paid less, they work half time, and it's not often always on their own work. It's for the person who's leading the lab. Now, that means we have a profession which isn't set up as a profession. We are not expressing ourselves as a profession. When parents ask me, you know, what can you do in science? It doesn't have the status of medicine and law or engineering because it's not viewed as a profession. So I think we do need a professional body that mandates how standing within the profession is aligned to qualifications and experience, sure salary levels are consistent, lobbies on behalf of scientists to ensure professional recognition and security of employment and remuneration. Because when employment is insecure, uh, it's women who are impacted disproportionately. Final stuff. So I think each generation of young women does begin by saying, yeah, and I think there should be a wonderful wind in their sails. I do not think that in 2019, some 20 years after this, that that final statement by really highly credentialed women, that their eyes were open to the realization that the playing field was not level, and they paid a high price both personally and professionally as a result. I am optimistic that uh, we have come to the point where we can accept uh, what we've done has not explained in any way some of the gaps that we've seen uh, between generations and, and <clears throat> in this um, gendered approach. And I'm really positive. Um, I love the way, um, particularly in the millennial generation, nobody is going to live with what has been the past. Just not going to happen. And reasonably, I think that says that we can have real hope um, that if the expectation is the system will adapt to bright, talented people, no matter their background, but based on their talent, their merit, and their credentials. So,